You're listening to Lady Audacity. I'm Alex. And I'm Meredith. And welcome to our first interview episode. It is so exciting. Unfortunately, it was a party for two. And a <laughs> thruple. I don't know. If Amanda's like, why did you call this a thruple? But it was with Amanda, the matter of fact. What ended up happening is, listen, we have heard, we, we, have, we have seen the reviews, okay? <laughs> we have like an audio thing maybe just email us okay can we just, <laughs> can we not hurt the rankings here i appreciate you but maybe like if the audio is better you can change your ratings i get it we we appreciate all of your patience it's been sort of a process to get up and running but alex literally for this pod ran out with her kid to pick up a microphone so she is sounding crisp she is Hello. sounding crisp. She is sounding better. (laughs) Listen, we are going to continue to do this. I am not an audio engineer, so we're just doing the best we can. We're kind of learning as we go. It will only get better from here. So because of that, because of the feedback issues we were having, it's just Matta and I on the interview. And I think you guys are really going to like it. So just a couple of housekeeping notes. In June, we will start our Women of the crown series. Um, we're doing Kate and Megan. We're just going right into it. Cause we know what you guys want. We know what you oh, want. Yeah. And our first episode is going to be specifically about Catherine Middleton, the princess of Wales. And then the second one in June will be Megan Markle Duchess of Sussex. That's hard to say. There's a lot of S's. There's a ton of S's. <laughs> and I will say what's very exciting about that. I feel like it's a little bit you wouldn't expect I will be covering Kate and Meredith will be covering be covering Megan. We wanted to switch it up a little bit, do our research, and we're going to kind of surprise one another with it too. So it's going to be really I think exciting. it's going to be super fun. And this is going to get more into the format that we envision these episodes going off of. We also, right now, um, I'm pretty sure we've locked in another interview. It's with a really, really cool guest. She's a writer. She's a podcaster. She's written books. I was like, oh, you're legit. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you're, we're, we're Lady Audacity. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Please like me. All by ourselves. Love Please. us. Please. <laughs> um, yeah, let me entertain you. And finally, we have a huge announcement coming for our first January episode. I'm just going to give you a little hint we we have heard you we know you want more content we found a way to potentially do that so we will be announcing more that's just a little easter egg if you will um get our taylor swift on so (laughs) just like this is not in your wildest dreams could you have anticipated this i'm i that's the only taylor lyric i could think of I'll admit, honestly, I was just going to make a dig about her dating Matt Healy, but... Oh, my God. (laughs) Okay. Can you... Okay. I know this is, like, not our normal... but This is media stuff. What... Can you explain to me what is... We're going to get into the articles, but can you explain to me what is going on there? Can I... Just quick rant. Quick rant here. Oh, oh, oh. She she put a finger out. She put a finger out. (laughs) Yeah. I like... Taylor Swift, I mean... uh, our song, I dedicate that to like every single crush I had in like, you know, senior year of high school. I get it, you guys. I get it. 1989, I was on that white feminism too. And I'm saying this as a black woman. Okay. I was on it too. I get it. But I am so perplexed by this move because her, I don't care if you like Taylor Swift or not. It's like the British royal family or the Kardashians. They have the best PR. It is so strategic. It's so well done. So for this girl To date someone who not a month ago was talking about he got off to black women being abused by white men in his porn selection. No, literally. And you guys, I am not exaggerating. Please look it up. Look it up. My face Um, is doing a lot of talking right now. Yes. Okay. Exactly. I am shocked. This wasn't five years ago. This wasn't a year ago. This was only three months ago on a podcast and it was so bad they had to pull the episode. So again, I just want to know the why, the P-R-Y. I understand that Kourtney Kardashian really started a trend with dating the bad boy, good girl dates bad boy. But I'm like, I'm sorry. There are so many bad rock, like bad boy rock stars out there that weren't talking about how they like women being abused in their porn, black women specifically. I'm just saying. And I just all a reminder that Taylor Swift has a high tolerance for anti-blackness. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, she she really does do the le- I mean, the fact that people made a really big deal out of her documentary and being like, we have to do something. Well, yes, but also yeah. <laughs> he got a platform. Listen, I'm going to say this as a white woman. White women are going to disappoint you. 
<laughs> they are going to disappoint you. It's not an excuse. We need to learn to do better, but it's just, I can't, I can't even figure out the move here because it's obviously not good for PR because she's on tour. I don't understand this I, move I, or to make it public. Well, someone brought up too that they think it has, and I know I'm going to say his name wrong. It's Jack Antoff. It's the guy that writes with Taylor a lot with the glasses. Oh, um, and, Antonoff. I don't know. Yeah, I just something think, like that. Wait, listen, we're on a first name basis. Call him Jack. Yeah, we'll call him Jack. And I guess they're friends. And mind you, Matt Healy also has a pass of anti-Semitism. Jack though is Jewish, so people try to be like, "Well, he's friends with Jack." It's no. okay. BS, BS. So that's like I like, have a black friend. That is the equivalent of being like, "I'm not racist. I have a black friend." It's literally doing that, and I mean, people are, think that like Jack has an album coming out. I guess Matt's supposed to be on it. Taylor's supposed to be on it. So it's like they can get together. Everyone promote the album. The album drops, and then they're gonna be like, "Oh, we decided to part ways." I'm just, I, I really do. Hope I know it probably won't shakes the core of her public persona. I know it won't, but I am glad people though. I'm actually surprised to see so much conversation going on about it. I and I'm very happy to see that. But I mean, I think she's going to go the royal, um, the royal route, and we'll just see her hugging and being around a lot of black people. <laughs> oh my god! Please br- bring out a black child to give a vicious side eye in a photo. <laughs> Some of the side eyes I was seeing in the Kate's photos for the garden. I mean, obviously lots of cute photos of the kids smiling on her. There was also some photos where the kids are like, what? Who? It reminds me. <laughs> it reminds me of the St. Lucia, the Caribbean trip with Sophie and Edward, where there's that one girl in the photo like, you believe this shit? It's giving, it was giving the office when they handed that black man a photo of them. They handed their present to the nation with a <laughs> photo of Sophia and Edward. Like, at least give them William and Kate, who are the main guys, okay? You gave me, like, the fourth rate. <laughs> like, these are the D actors you gave me a photo of. That man's face. It's literally Michelle Obama's face when, um, what's her name? Melanie Trump gave her the, um. Melania. The, yeah, I, Melania. That's an Alexism. Can I tell you why I like it though? You make her sound like like a twice divorced mom <laughs> that's 45 waitressing in okay. I don't know Cleveland. Kim Zolziak. <laughs> it's kind of amazing actually. It's giving me Kim Zolziak vibes, however you say oh her my. name. You know what's funny? What? You pronounced Zolziak perfectly. <laughs> Camilla will trip you up. <laughs> Melanie, give me some Melanie Trump over here. She's working at Denny's, but obviously it was like really fancy in a past life and it's like my fancy past life is like honey we can't do basic we can't do basic words it's true (laughs) okay so moving into um before we get into the interview we want to discuss two bananas articles from the week that we cannot stop thinking about now in the podcast interview i do touch on we do touch on with amanda um, the New York City car chase. And we do talk a little bit about that, but not going to lie, we are burnt out. And I think some of you guys are too with the relentless coverage on that. So we chose kind of different articles that we think are just as important or just as bananas. So Alex, yes. kick it off. Okay. So we are going to kick it off with an article by the Daily Beast from Tom Sykes. Now, I just want to do um, a little background here. Daily Beast Tom Sykes has been getting quite a few leaks and it's usually been from KP. I would say the last three to four months. Um, I'll admit I was kind of hesitant to believe they were getting a true leak because this is an American media. Mind you, is it kind of like your Daily Mail, your, um, you know, the Sun type of writing and coverage and tabloid-esque? Yes. So it does make sense in that way. But I'm like, but still, why are they going to randomly leak to this person? And my friend reminded me that Tom Sykes is your um, Eaton boy. He famously wrote a book about it, how he became an alcoholic there when he was like 14. His family, yeah, his family has ties to the royals. I think it's his grandparents that were close to like King George. I mean, he his current family right now aren't as close to the royals, but it's more like he's on the outskirts. It's very easy that he can get a hold of someone who's, you know, maybe two degrees of separation from William and his close friends. So it wouldn't be shopping. Oh, Tom, he went to Eton. He graduated with one of my older friends. Why not leak to him? And he's got the American outlet. 
So going off of that, I'm going to start paying attention to him and what he writes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he wrote was about the chase. And now I'm just going to read this headline so you guys can know what we're going to be getting into. So the headline reads, Royal Friends Mock Harry and Meghan as NYC Car Chase Story Unravels. And it's under hysterical. Okay, so, you know, leading you off the tone here. So it's a lot of gaslighting, a lot of it could have been worse. This is what happens when you go to too much therapy type of making fun of them. But let's read a couple of the quotes. So asked if William, whose spokesperson has declined to comment on the incident, would at least take Harry's side on the issue of invasive paparazzi, the friend said, William and Catherine have put up with shit like this in the past. Everyone understands his anger at the photographers, but making hysterical statements doesn't help matters, especially when, as the Queen might have said, recollections may vary. Let's pause for an office side eye right now. (laughs) Also, really cute during... It's really cute during Mental Health Awareness Month. Like, really, really cool, really cool stuff you got going on there. Really? Like, this is so cute. Your wife's out there talking about anxiety and, you know, supporting one another. And you're out here making fun of a man for being, quote unquote, hysterical. Because, you know, he was riding a car being literally, literally chased by paparazzi like his mother was. No reason to be hysterical. Yeah, no, definitely no underlying PTSD and trauma that he's probably working on in different therapies, which we know about. And also those alternative therapies have been mocked as well. It's almost like it's almost like y'all don't give a crap about mental health. I would be honestly, if I were William and Kate, I would be pissed about this leak. And this is what always has made me so sad is that this consistently keeps happening with the leaks against the mental health. So at this point, It's like, we can't pretend like they don't at least know about this and aren't stopping it, you know? And I think the issue too is the only time we've seen them stop it was when the Sunday Times put that, you know, for their their headline for the front of the paper was, I can't put my arms around my brother anymore. And it was like some sort of subtext too about how William's sick of Harry and is complaining and is whining about his mental health. William quickly had that pulled. Mind you, it was still in the article, but it wasn't the headline anymore. And then that was when the statement came out that Harry was like, I, they signed this without getting my consent when they were saying William would never make fun of his mental health and stuff. And Harry made it clear. I did not sign off on that. I thought he, maybe this is a different one. I thought he signed off, like someone signed off on his behalf that they were unified in their decision to like, for Harry and Meghan to step back. It could be a different thing too, but I was just remembering because I was reminded that that instance did happen where um, Harry and William, you know, um, everyone, they kind of released a statement on William's behalf that he didn't agree to. Oh, so yeah. So this is, I just looked it up really quick. This is from Town and Country by Caroline Haleman. Sorry if I said that wrong. Prince William and Prince Harry issue a strongly worded joint statement about their relationship. For brothers who care so deeply about the issues surrounding mental health, the use of inflammatory language in the in this way is offensive and potentially harmful. So that was about the accusations that the William and Kate were bullying the Sussex. And that's when they released this statement. Yes. Okay. So, See, I learned something new on this podcast every day, every other week. Harry, real quick, what he said about this when he was saying, I didn't sign this. I was told about a joint statement that had been put out in mine and my brother's name, squashing the story about him bullying us out of the family. Harry says, I couldn't believe it. No one had asked me. He continues. No one had asked me. No one had asked me permission to put my name to a statement like that. And I rang M and I told her and she burst into floods of tears because within four hours, they were happy to lie to protect my brother. And yet for three years, they were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. Exactly. And I think it comes down to, um, and this was what he was never going to escape, is it's always more important to protect Prince William, the future king's image, than it is anyone else. And that's inherently how this all works. And actually, so speaking about that, the article I found was actually a polled article, which I can only imagine was polled because of the content. And it's so interesting. It kind of reminds me of the Catherine Middleton's ancestor freed the slaves enslaved people (laughs) you know what i mean so megan should be grateful remember that unhinged article but it was supposed to be complimentary is the craziest part well and i think we see this here with the tom sykes article and too and something i find funny about times tom sykes because i think it kind of goes into what you're saying of protecting the um the hair but i think feel like even when that happens because you'll see in this article when they are going to make jabs at the air 
it's still not as aggressive as what you're going to see against the spare. Never. And it's so funny because Tom Sykes, if you look at his history, he does like, not like Megan and Harry. And before Megan came along, though, he wasn't really a Harry fan either. But the funny thing is, in what, I think this is 2017, 2018, for the Daily Beast, he actually talks about the Rose cheating rumors. And I kind of want to read this part, too, because I think it's a really good example, again, of what some of Harry has talked about, how it can be a friend of a friend is going out to dinner with a journalist or someone who knows a journalist who works there. It's just like, and how easily gossip can be traded and then ends up in, you know, the magazine. So... I pulled this from Celeb Bitchy. She has the summary on here, but this is his section from the Daily Beast. So his section right here. While the working life of my hard-bitten colleagues at the Daily Beast involves a punishing regimen of worn shoe leather, lightning fast short hand, and an easy facility with navigating the murkier corners of the dark web, my working life is rather different. My best scoops all seem to come from my country house dinner parties, shooting weekends, and my network of family, friends, and old school and university friends. A reminder, you guys, he went to the schools that William and all his friends went to. Goes on to say, it was at a dinner party attended by one of my top sources, the daughter of an earl, that I first heard the shocking rumors that Prince William was having an affair with one of his neighbors and it was over a family lunch that I was told that William and Harry really, really don't get on with their dad and he finds their habit of publicly emoting, embarrassing, and, un- and undignified. Both parties were den- Both stories were denied by the palace, of course. Obviously, he has not talked about Rose since that whatsoever at all. But again, I think it's a good insight, especially because how things flipped between 2018 and 2019. No one talked about these things, but more so how these people can be getting information. You said the daughter of an earl, right? Yes. Okay, later, remind me later, I might dig into that because I made a whole Turnip Toffs mind map because I'm literally out of my mind. Um, And I want to, I actually want to, kind of maybe proposition who it might be so yes, that would be great <laughs> speaking of things we don't talk about this article from the daily express when i when it came up in my google alerts i said what so <laughs> the title is kate treats prince william like the fourth child as he is prone to tantrums which wow and, and then it, and it says exclusive a palace insider has provided a cute insight into the inner workings of prince william Kate, Princess of Wales's marriage. Oh, so when do we get to the cute part? Because infantilizing <laughs> grown men as your fourth child seems kind of reductive. Um, girl boss. Anyway, so they they start off with a poll. We love a poll. We got to talk about how much Britons love William and Kate, which of course they mm-hmm. do. Their kids are adorable. Agreed. Okay. Enemy number one. That's why. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we get into Tom Quinn. He's the author of a new book called Gilded Youth, an intimate history growing up in the royal family. He shares conversations that he had with a source that worked closely with William and Kate in Kensington Palace. Obviously, you have to take all of this with a grain of salt. You, you're you hearing someone's words filter through another person who perhaps witnessed events. You know, you just have to consider motivations. So he's, he's like, yeah, they have terrific rows, like any marriage does. Then he goes on to say, but where some couples have a, r- a row and throw heavy vases at each other, William and Kate throw cushions at each other. It's always kept under control. That is horrifying. I and I I I literally last night was looking up to see if this was like an English term I don't know about <laughs> that means something else and not literally that they get into the row. And my thing too is the fact that they're even being equated to the type of fighting where you're throwing things. And this isn't the first time this has happened. I cannot think of the article out of the top of my head like the headline or anything like that, but I think it actually might have been part of Kate's 40th birthday press because, you know, they talk about William and Kate in the relationship, but it's a lot of this. He's a child. She keeps him in line. Oh, and they can argue. KP staff has said so, but don't worry, guys. Kate can give it just as much as William gives it. And I'm just like, this is not a good thing. This is So not this isn't thing. healthy. I mean, I'm not saying it's giving big little lies season <laughs> one, but like this, if you had a girlfriend come to you. If, you, if a girlfriend came to you and said, hey, my husband is totally like another child, and the only way we can deal with his tantrums is him throwing something as a release, you would say, um, I think we want to look into counseling. I think he might need tools. And I honestly, management. If, if William struggles with his anger, I'm not, even, I'm not making fun of that. I actually think it's probably horrible because he probably feels horrible afterwards. But like, this ain't it. Like, no. this is not it. And it's actually, so I sat there and I thought to myself, wow, this story tries to paint this as a positive, which if it was about Harry and Meghan, it would be like, 
it would be so different. It would be people want to lock him up. But I also wonder, so obviously William and Kate got this poll. There's no way. This thing yeah. was down. There is no way. They got blowback. I'm sure lawyers reached out. But I also right. wondered, like, I'm still not convinced that that BP and KP aren't leaking against each other because obviously Kate and William know that they're the future, you know, rulers and they want to prep themselves for that transition whenever it happens. And at the same time, Charles and Camilla are like, hold up, hold up. We, I've been waiting for this for like a million mm-hmm. years. Um, you know, Camilla, Camilla has been through it. Okay. Like <laughs> rightly or not. Yeah. And this is our time to shine. This is our time to be a star. So I wonder if there's some effort to kind of knock William and Kate kind of down a peg. So, you know, I personally 100% think the Windsor War is brewing. I'll admit, my conspiracy, and this, you guys, you know, cue, cue, the, put your tinfoil hats on, guys. I'm going super conspiracy here. Pretend there's background music. <laughs> <laughs> I do low-key wonder sometimes if this is Kate and her team leaking against William. I know that's wild, but let's be real. Whenever these articles about their relationship come out, if you are not into that traditional misogynistic mindset, you're like, poor Kate, poor Kate. You know what I mean? William's an asshole. He's an asshole. He's a baby. And again, I feel for this man. I've said it once. I've said it a thousand times. I can't imagine what he's been through. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, um, the relationship with his father, I can't imagine. I think people forget, even from Diana's own admissions, that she leaned on William in a way that no child should have their mother or any grown adult leaning on them. So I cannot imagine the things that he has seen and he has heard and he has not dealt with. Because yeah. from what we know, he has not gone to therapy. And I remember heads together. I always thought it was so weird that Harry was openly talking about his mental health and William and Kate were like, oh, we don't struggle with that, but we're here to support you. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, really? And now I'm just kind of like, that's so sad, William. I hope you don't honestly believe that. But if you do, I hope someone can push you to get help because you are going to turn into your father and you already are. Can we, can we get it together, guys? Can we get it together? Oh so my God. I can't stop thinking about this now. Right. So I'm just like, I feel bad for this guy, but I'm also like, I can't imagine Kate's situation in all of this and her knowing at this point, this relationship is more of a business than anything. Let's be real. Divorce really is not on the table for either of them. If it is true at all, they are not happy or whatever. I, I agree. I don't, true, it's not I don't think choice. they're getting divorced. It's I never going to be a I choice. think in no way. But it, it is interesting, this idea of, okay, in my conspiracy, this is conspiracy it's mode. Still conspiracy, guys. Yes. Okay. So let's say like allegedly William had an affair. Let's just say allegedly, allegedly. he had an affair yes. with Rose Hanbury. Okay. And a lot of people are like, oh, she's going to be the next queen. Like she's like Camilla's the side chick inspiration. It's like, no, I don't believe that. But if you wanted to really secure your spot and your beloved, I mean, obviously we saw what happened when Charles and Diana divorced. It's like people love Diana, didn't love Charles. Yeah. And so they actually against one another all the time. Charles and Diana were constantly leaking against one another while they were still married. Yeah. And, and if, and that would make, you know, William's popularity would drop like Charles is dead. So maybe in some ways this is like Kate kind of securing, securing her place as beloved and necessary Mm -hmm. for a successful rule from William. Like William is nothing without Kate and his children. Let's be real. If the, if Kate divorced him, the most he would have is being a single dad to try to, you know, um, capitalize on but he just doesn't have a personality people like him because he's kate's husband let's be real like that's kate's husband (laughs) yeah no we definitely we definitely don't need know william very well and what i'm gonna say is these articles um we are going to link in the show notes so no worries they will be there okay and now it is time for my interview with miss amanda matta of matta effect fame Clap, clap. <laughs> and now, for a woman who truly does not need an introduction, but we're going to give her one anyway. Amanda Matta, perhaps better known as Matta Fact on TikTok, is the number one royal commentator with a highly engaged audience of over 1.2 
million followers. She has provided live coverage for the Platinum Jubilee and the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, and most recently, for the coronation of King Charles III. Her daily content on TikTok and Instagram touches on every aspect of royal watching with an intersectional twist, including fashion, media, history, and yes, all the tea. (laughs) Amanda also produces the Art of History podcast available wherever you get your podcast. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here. We have our tea. We're holding up our tea. Absolutely. I am so excited. Actually, so Amanda and I have known each other, you know, virtually for a while now, but this is the first time we've ever actually talked. Yeah, face to face. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, look at us. This is like our meet cute. Yeah, totally. It's better than like a Zoom happy hour. Like those were the bane of my existence for a while. So I much prefer a podcast. Oh my God, you, I literally just had flashbacks. I remember I was very pregnant during the pandemic. (sighs) That was fun with gestational diabetes, more fun. And I, my friends were like, let's do like a Zoom thing. And we did it once and it was so depressing. We were like, we, we can't do that again. It's not fun. Not cute. Oh, this is cute. Flashbacks. This is way cuter, way cuter. Well, so happy to have you here. Let's dive in and just talk about like what's going on right now in the media, any stories that are on your mind related to the British royal media or non-working royals as it may be. What do you got? (laughs) Definitely. Um, Right now, uh, it's almost like we came off the the coronation and everyone had this moment of like, oh, now what? Now what am I going to focus on? And (laughs) it's so amusing to me that for some people, they have now latched onto what they view as conspiracies in various places. But my favorite one has to be involving the Disney company um, that, that what can you say about Disney and the group of people who profess to be royalists? They are kind of diametrically opposed, right? On, on two sides of this culture clash, you know? So right now royalists are upset at Disney for an apparent line change dialogue change in the little mermaid remake um okay what what was said so uh, from my understanding i haven't seen the movie yet um there is a line that was changed from the original cartoon little mermaid where prince eric is trying to guess what ariel's name is in the original he says i think mildred and in the updated he first guesses diana and then he guesses catherine and after he says catherine (laughs) apparently Ariel just like pulls a face like a very disgruntled disgusted face because that's not her name and wouldn't you know it royalists have run with this as oh it's a slight at princess Catherine at the princess of Wales and uh, I just I think I think we've taken this a little too far if this is where we've ended up it's funny to me that Megan is both a z-list actress with nothing going (laughs) for her but also in charge of final edits for yes. a huge Disney production. Because it's amazing. This is, this is Megan's fault, clearly. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, I know. It's it's clearly. But what's interesting, too, is I saw one of the articles and apparently is doing like a lot of heavy lifting because mm-hmm. it seems like this is based off of one critic who went to see the movie and their mm-hmm. um, interpretation of well, her facial expressions. True. Correct. And I will say the royalists have a man on the inside because Richard Eden, who is, oh, let me get his title correct because he'll- I'll Oh my God, Richard Eden. He is the Daily Mail's diary editor and broadcaster. Um, and he runs like a royal newsletter. And I think he's usually on like a talk show about the royals. He apparently got a preview of the movie. And oh. after after viewing it, he tweeted- Remake of The Little Mermaid does include what appears to be a dig at the Princess of Wales. I can confirm after a preview today. So he's confirming that it includes what appears to be a dig at Kate, which, you know, the perceived slight is, you know, at this point, Ariel doesn't have her voice and she's trying to be she's being defined like just purely by the way Prince Eric is is encountering her and seeing her. And so apparently they're reading into it to the point where they understand that this dig at Catherine is saying she doesn't have a voice and that she can't speak for herself. Uh, And they think that's what Disney is like mocking her for. Um, Never mind the fact that Diana is another name that they chose. I think they were just going for like princessy names. Names that that people would recognize. But apparently, no, it's, it's the height of insult and we need to boycott Disney. 
You know, I really thought that the height of the controversy over the Disney movie was going to be a Black <laughs> Little Mermaid because, my God, remember how fun that conversation was? It was like three years ago, though. This movie has been in production. I, I think mm-hmm. the the lead, um, it's it's ha- is it Halle Berry? Because it's not like Halle, Halle Berry. Bailey. Halle Bailey. Bailey. It's I very know. hard. Yes. Um, Halle Bailey. She said something like, I started this movie when I was 18 and then we finished it and, I, and I'm 21. Yeah. Which <laughs> so is she's crazy. Lived. Yes. I know, yeah. I so thought that long. was going to be the, the biggest part of the controversy around this movie. I thought they couldn't top that, but um, they did somehow. They found a way. Yes. Yeah. It just, and also, I mean, again, I have not watched the original movie in quite some time, the cartoon, Mm -hmm. but from what I can remember, Ariel is more frustrated that, that she's not being understood and that he doesn't see her and what her name is obviously supposed to be. (laughs) We're going to have to watch and see for ourselves. I cannot believe there are some days where I make a video or record something and I cannot believe it's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Like I can... I cannot. What? Okay. What is like the strangest thing you had to make a video on? Oh my gosh! I mean, the Aquazera shoes. That that that's up there. That, that was, was but a recent yours was one. so good. Your research oh, into that you. was impeccable. And again, it's just stuff I've I've picked up along the way as I've been royal watching. I'm trying to remember if there was anything that could top that. Like just random out of pocket things that that's should a good not one. matter. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely think on it. But then I was thinking the other thing besides the Little Mermaid is the controversy over the Citadel TV show, not the not the college Citadel TV show. Sure. On Amazon Prime, which, again, is also Meghan Markle's fault. Well, yeah, obviously. obviously. Yeah. And and here and what's really interesting to me about it is, of course, I love to look at the media and how the media mm-hmm. tr- choose to portray these things. Mm-hmm. And what was really interesting about that is a lot of them had you know a split screen of Priyanka with Megan because obviously Mm -hmm. and Kate and then like a little itty bitty potential clip of Citadel or nothing at all and it's it's always labeled as Megan Markle's friend in show Mm -hmm. that has jibe against because it's for SEO and so for all the talk I want to make a t-shirt that's like it's not Megan it's SEO because that's what it is that's why you include her in the headline and Meghan Markle's beloved Disney because she narrated, was it a documentary about elephants? She was an them? elephant. She was yeah. an elephant. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's the way they find these connections that make no sense, make Correct. absolutely no sense. And the thing with the Citadel. So, of course, I was like, I got to watch this show. Which I've and- never heard of before they started making a big deal out of this show. No offense to Priyanka Jonas, but... Oh, I'm taken. I, I, I'm also best friends with Priyanka, and oh, she sorry. told me no offense. No offense <laughs> taken. Um, it's one of those shows that if you're into like a big budget spy mm. thriller, blood, like glossy, yeah, like pithy one liners. I mean, mm. I will say the shining star in that show because I did watch an episode. That's all I'm going to be watching. No offense. Sure. Uh, if you like it, you know, I won't yuck your yum. But um, oh my God, Stanley Tucci, Stanley Tucci is in it. Oh, well, and now he is my interest. He's great. Yeah. Um, so what ends up happening is Priyanka, I, def- I, f- I think her character's name is Nadia, but her partner, who they like, they also sleep together because they're sexy spies. Oh, sure. But Mason something, he's hot. Okay, he's hot. I'm going to say they did a good job. Um, so he is on his way to see, <laughs> it feels so weird to describe this because it's so weird. Okay, he's on his way to confront like the Portuguese cartel or mob and Nadia is in an earpiece in -hmm. his ear. Priyanka, he gets into the room and like the boss is there with a cigar and the son is there and she's kind of telling him like, okay, you have to make a really big ask. Like you have to do this big. And he says something like, I want you to get to the chief of the armed forces. And the cartel dude says oh, it'd be easier to get between the Duchess of Cambridge's legs or something like that. Ah. She's not in the scene. Sure. And even if she was in the scene, it's it's art. It's TV. It's supposed mm-hmm. to, in some ways, sometimes be controversial. I mean, I can't think of a lot of art that isn't in some ways controversial, but also this was a throwaway line. Yeah. That's and it's just amazing it. to me that this is the issue Mm-hmm. When like there's entire shows like The Prince, the HBO <laughs> Max show. I mean, are you really taking offense to this? But also, 
are yeah. the same people that are upset about this. And obviously it's Meghan Markle's fault because she has final say on the script. And Priyanka mm-hmm. should have marched into the writer's room and told them to change a line of another character. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if the same people that are upset about that were also gleefully laughing at the South Park episode about... You- Harry you and know that they were. You know that they were. You know it's not about what was said, but about who it was said about. And, you know, I think it's a kind of gross, a little misogynistic throwaway line. But that's showbiz, baby. You know, there's always going to be these references made about females. And I'm not saying we should, like, be happy about that yeah. or be content with it. But that's the game that is played in Hollywood and on the Amazon Prime, you know, cutting room floor, whatever. Uh, And yeah, if you object to it being said about Kate in this way, then where's your outrage over all of the horrible things being said about Megan on a daily basis to a much higher degree? You know, this is one instance that they've been able to be upset about. I'm not even going to count the Disney one because that's an alleged or what appears to be a slight. It's not even a direct reference, but it's It's, just the hypocrisy. It's telling that it was one line that they can focus on. It kind of shows you perhaps how little this does happen, which again, I agree with you. That's not a bad thing. I also think that at some point when you're a public figure, a Royal, a celebrity, you know that you're going to show you, you might be a line or a jeopardy clue or whatever. Yeah. Like this isn't, you know, I I don't think Kate is losing sleep over this. I would hope not. Um, I imagine if Megan's tuned a lot of this out, I would imagine Kate has as well. Um, But yeah, it's just, It does go to show you how little there is to consume about Kate in pop culture that they can get this worked up about, that they're clinging on to this one reference and will probably beat it into the ground as much as they can. Well, especially if they can tie it to Meghan Markle, because this whole playbook of Mm -hmm. a woman versus a woman, because all women are ever doing is doing things to slight someone else. That's all women are doing, which actually is misogynistic to both women. And that's what gets me is like, so much of this is actually a larger problem, but I don't know about you. There's just, people are so polarized in their thinking Hmm. that there's like no room for gray, especially when it comes to Kate and Megan. Absolutely. Um, And I've, you know, I've talked about this on other podcasts before as well, because it is polarization is what performs and what gets me, you know, my livelihood. If I want to get views, I got to be a little hyperbolic. I have to be a little bit polarizing. And it's tough to pull yourself out of that and say, well, no, I do really value nuance. I do value these gray areas and having the discussion. But it's so much harder to get people to engage in that conversation. It's so hard. And when the what's really frustrating, too, and I've learned to let this go, is when the comment section goes completely left. And yes. even if you have done your best and you've laid things out and you've you've even maybe requested comments stay on topic, it mm-hmm. does not matter. No. People will just go at it. Um, I think what always gets to me, though, is sometimes some of the vitriol. Like, I've, I've seen vitriol about Megan and Kate. Like, you could just place the names like interchange Mm -hmm. the names and that's sometimes I'm like we're almost so on opposite ends of the spectrum that we're gonna like meet in a circle you know what I mean yeah I've had a few uh, just as an example of that I've had a few moments where I'll see a comment come up in my notification and it's saying something pretty negative pretty derogatory about one of them and it'll use like uh like their title or like just say the duchess the princess and i'm reading it and i'm like which one is this about because it could be either of them and then i have to go in and like read the comment thread and then decide from there how to moderate it based on who they're talking about and like so i've tried it tried to come up with like comment policies and things for my page and it's hard because the way that this language gets used about each of them you know, there are differences, but at the end of the day, you do have to decide where is this just a line that I'm going to draw because we're being gross about women, period. Yep. And that's where, and that's where I'm kind of at. And I I know a lot of creators, I've talked to Lord Everett about this too. It's also Mm -hmm. hard seeing like really negative derogatory, like for example, the the slut shaming of Camilla Parker Bowles. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, I think she is, you know, she's the patron, she's the patron saint of scheming whores. And I say that lovingly. 
Okay. It takes a lot of gumption to Mm -hmm. get to where she is at. But when people start to slut shame her, it's like, I always think, would I say this or would this person say this about someone they like? Yeah. You know? And it's like, eh, maybe we could just tone that down. Yeah. And I've, I've just come to the point where that's a losing battle. Like, because if you do go on record and I've done this a few times and say, guys, like, come on, guys and girls, let's remember that this is still a person like this language. I know you think it's okay because of how universally she seems to be disliked, but come on. And the pushback whenever I do that is interesting. It's very interesting to me as a person who creates like intersectional content because people will come back with, well, she's a racist, so it's okay. And I'm like, "Mm, those, those two things aren't really connected. I see your, I see your logic. I see your reasoning. It's not landing for me. Like it's, you can express your frustration with somebody's behavior and beliefs without resorting to that type of language. That's what I think too. It doesn't excuse what she's done. And I think, and this is the thing, I think we can be critical of her actions. And I've even said we should be, I even think sometimes the the putting Megan on a pedestal and, and the vilifying, they're both ways of dehumanizing people because mm-hmm. you're not actually seeing the person for who they are, which is just a human being who makes mistakes and is going mm-hmm. to make missteps. Yeah. You see them as either a caricature, a villainous caricature, or this perfect item you know that you can't you can't say anything about that yeah. might be construed as negative and i don't think that allows for actual conversation so whenever mm-hmm. i do a deep dive i really try to find one thing that i can relate to with mm-hmm. i even found one for piers morgan because i was oh. like i cannot turn these do you want to hear what it is yes please piers morgan is very pro gun control extremely oh. pro gun control and when he was on cnn he went after the nra Wow. Like there are, so I have to find something yeah. where I'm like, wait, I recognize that in myself. I recognize sure. that passion. Yeah. Just so I don't get sucked into, you know what I mean? Looking yes. at him as a caricature. Well, and that's part of it as well is, is we're seeing the persona that these people have built. We're not seeing them as people. We are never going to get to know them as people because everything is filtered through layers and layers of you know, comms people, PR people, or their own, like, mask that they're putting on to play a role, whether that's a duchess or a talking head, like, that's all very intentional. And it's so hard to, you know, get to the root of a person's identity as an onlooker when you don't actually know them in person. So I don't know how I feel about your little tie to Piers Morgan, because, you know, the rest of the time- he's terrible yeah so but it's yeah it's something to keep in mind and uh something that i would love for more people to be able to tap into recognizing but like you said it's we've become so polarized that if if we with our platforms you know are the ones starting that conversation more people are liable to just tune us out and stick to their own little echo chamber and actually engage with that and yeah, and to the point, I'm clearly I am I am not shilling for Piers Morgan. I don't stand no, Piers Morgan, I but I think I think it still allows us to be critical of you intentionally decided to take a sharp, sharp mm-hmm. turn into kind of like an alt right troll is his mask that he wears. Mm-hmm. You decided to do that for profit. So I don't know if you're able to put your morals aside or if you just don't have any, but I think that's the part that really grosses me out. Like you chose to lean into this persona that's just hateful and so many people ask me oh my god they either say Piers Morgan's wife like what does she know about it or they might have sympathy for her and I said Mm -hmm. don't have sympathy for Celia Walden she writes the Mm -hmm. same kind of stuff for the telegraph yeah this is like this is like pre-dinner conversation this is like appetizer conversation for them yeah, it's just become so normalized. And it's a good point. Like, do they not know? Do they not realize how, like, far afield they've taken these personas? Do they not care? <laughs> like, and, and maybe and maybe the money is worth it. And again, I think capitalism ruins most things. That's and the thing is, like, sometimes I look at, um, I don't know, to use a more banal example, like an influencer who has shilled for a product that they once claimed to despise or something like that. And I look, I have to look at that situation and be like, in the mirror to myself, you would do it too. You would do it too for a check. You know, at, at some point, 
but you that's know, a good point. That's a that is a good point. Human. Right? I don't know. <laughs> it's true. It's it's how to and yeah, it's a totally different conversation. But how to exist in a moral way within a capitalist society yeah, is way lower very, stakes, but very difficult. Yes. Um. So just getting back to your content creation, how did this? How did this even start? Like, was this your plan? <laughs> how did this come about? Have you always nope. been interested in the royals? Yeah. So it was never a plan. Um. I've always had this kind of awareness of the royals started when my mother had a book of princess diana paper dolls um they were the charity auction dresses which now i know way more about but as a kid i just knew oh this is a beautiful woman these are beautiful dresses wait she's real she's a princess uh and it kind of snowballed from there so like my first entry into royal watching for myself was will and kate's wedding as i think it was for a lot of you know millennials yep um and then uh, on the side of that like at the same time I was getting interested in history I ended up going to school for art history um and I was always drawn to pieces that had either like a royal patronage behind them or a royal subject like at the center of them and I just kind of amassed this working knowledge from there um so fast forward to the Harry and Meghan Oprah interview <laughs> is where it kind of popped off and like I, I think that's fitting because Harry and Meghan were kind of the next generation's entry into royal watching i think people who were maybe a little too young to watch will and kate's wedding harry and Meghan's wedding you know that was it you were watching you were you were up early it was a saturday like everyone could watch um so after the harry and Meghan oprah interview i had all these thoughts uh it was was that covid yeah it was it was <laughs> time is just a blur i time uh, is meaningless yes um, all these thoughts, nobody in my daily life really to share them with because we were quarantined. So I made a TikTok and it's at this point, production value, like in the negatives, uh, th my angle was terrible. My audio was awful. I looked terrible, <laughs> but I was talking about the claim that Megan made, which was, I think the most, you know, bombshell claim out of that interview. Who was it that made the comments about baby Archie's skin tone? Oh, so you dove right in. You I were did. like, let me no dive off up. a cliff. Wow. And okay, that I video, like you. Thank you. <laughs> that video also just, I think it was like 3 million views in the first week. So no, no warm up for me. I was just kind of doing it. Um, and so I oh posted. I know. <laughs> and so like, I, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. That's kind of crazy. Um. I posted like a follow up. I think it was like a comment reply video. Someone had asked for clarification on something. And then I just did another and another and another. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm, I'm making content. Cool. <laughs> that is. And actually, you know what? Now that I know more about you and about the fact that your background is in mm -hmm. art history, it actually yeah. makes sense because you even when you're looking at an event or an outfit or media, you do have that dissection where you look at the full picture and then you pick out pieces that are that are good to hone in on that might have a larger message. So that does come across actually. Oh, Art history, uh, good for becoming a content creator. Surprisingly good. Actually, I remember one stat that they told us, uh, I studied art history and museum studies. It was a two, two in one program, junior out of college, Huntington, Pennsylvania, shout out. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember there was a stat they told us that of people who take the MCAT, who like didn't do a science program, like you don't have to necessarily have a science degree to take the MCAT, I guess. They said the top performing people had art history degrees because they had learned how to observe, how to look at a situation. Um, so thank you for picking up on that. That's, that's, I, I love to kind of figure out what brought people to a point. And when you said yeah. you were an art history major, mm -hmm. I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> I get it. And, but you're yeah. right. But also how it's also interesting because we've kind of like lost the ability to, to sit back and observe because mm -hmm. things are so fast. Yes. And I think that's a really good skill. I think that's almost a skill that everyone needs to learn because yeah. it's so crucial in being able to then, you know, dissect the news mm -hmm. because so much of it is people moving too fast and like, yeah. I almost can't even talk about the car chase. I still, I feel like emotionally hungover still from the mm -hmm. Harry and Meghan car chase, mostly because of the the media that came out and that was, anticipation yeah. of how bad the media was going to be. Yeah. It was like a 12 hour, it, it's in hindsight, like a blitz of coverage, but at the time it felt like a slow rolling, like train wreck, just watching people cling on to whatever point they could to back up their own existing beliefs about Harry and Meghan. Um, and 
you know, that's the, the thing that I most often find myself having regrets with, with my content is, oh, I hopped on this too fast and I missed something. I wish I could have done this more holistically. With the Harry and Meghan car crash that, you know, we didn't have that luxury of waiting because so much misinformation and disinformation was just getting peddled and being picked up as truth so, so quickly. It was really frustrating. And I know you felt the same. Oh, I've, uh, yeah, every, I I told one of my lives, I said, every content creator is feeling the same way. We are all emotionally eating. We all had our different Mm -hmm. Uber Eats that we ordered that night to just Mm -hmm. see our way through. Yeah, it was hard. I I felt like I had more like emotional um, reactions in my first videos because it was like really upsetting, you know, especially Mm -hmm. when you start seeing the parallels with Diana, which are there with the media coverage. And and the, because I'm starting to look more into Diana's media coverage before and after the crash just to kind of get a glimpse and some of those articles you could you could just put in Megan's name it's amazing I I had no idea because I I was young I was Mm -hmm. nine or how old were you when Diana died I was like two or three I was oh my god it's not even part of I'm sorry wait Amanda are you 30 (laughs) I'm 28 (laughs) wait so you started this god I I guess because like just of the way you like carry yourself and stuff I just you don't look older I just thought you had a baby face you know what I mean sure but wow you were I mean to start a TikTok channel at like 25 26 Mm -hmm. and have it blow up like that like I cannot imagine I don't know just like the pressure how has it been good and how has it been like not so good in your life (laughs) Uh, well (laughs) that's a great I know right it's like (laughs) Meredith answer your own question uh, you know, you know the answer. No, I mean, the worst part was probably getting doxxed um, because there are those people out there who see even something as, in the grand scheme, minor as a TikTok channel, uh, as, a, as a huge threat to their worldview and to, you know, the, 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 the belief that everything is fine, that the royal family is lovely. Because um, one thing I, I knew I was never going to compromise on was you know, I, I'm very open that I'm a leftist and I believe in like yeah. racial justice and social justice. Hell yeah. Uh, some people don't and they put those things aside in order to support the monarchy. Um, so one thing I had to like come to terms with very early on was that I had associated my face and my real name with my content. And that was enough for some people to feel justified in targeting me. Um, so, you know, that was the low point, but since then it's only kind of reinforced my belief that this content is important and it matters, even though it is just a TikTok, you know, just an Instagram, but it's helping the conversation move along. And I, I really love that, like, I'm a part of that. And I think too, I mean, you're not a part of it. You are like the leader of it. You are, I see every time I open up an article, I'm like, oh, there's Matta being, being quoted (laughs) or there's Amanda. There's a, oh, there's my friend. It's just like, you are everywhere. You are, you are, uh, as Candy would say, Candy from Real Housewives of Atlanta, she's worldwide. (laughs) You're worldwide, my friend. I, you know, and I'm still just in my living room, you know, (laughs) so that's the best part though. I feel like it's like kind of the democratization of information. Sure. You don't need to go necessarily to college to learn some learn mm-hmm. some of this stuff. Understand researching or different things about the British royal family. You can go on TikTok and if mm-hmm. you if you hit up a reliable source, mm-hmm. you get some really good information, which I think is important and it's something I've been thinking about with media literacy just how mm-hmm. kind of closed off it is for a lot of people. Yeah. And you know, and I don't think there should be gatekeeping. I think it's something everyone should learn. And I think it would make us better media consumers because I've wrestled with this. I don't know how you solve this media problem with the British media and the British Royal family. I, in particular, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, do you go under one comms team? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Yeah, I think, I mean, solving it has even so many different meanings too, for, because are you solving it for the royal family? Are you solving it for the public? Because the royal family's relationship with the press has always been in the interest of perpetuating themselves, protecting themselves. But that's not in the public's best interest. The public has a right to know certain things about these people who are at the center of what is still a system of government. You know, the royals can go on and on about how they're not political. It's still a political system. And it's still a system that holds a lot of weight for people. So the question has been raised in the past several years, especially how much does the public have a right to know about the royals? And 
solving the problem of the media relationship with the palace looks very different depending on who is, you know, at the center of that. That's a very good point. And I don't think unless there's a financial incentive to stop covering them or cover them differently, I don't think the media changes. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And I think we've, I think it's hard because in some ways, like we should be able to trust the media that they're giving us the most important information. Mm -hmm. But with the British royal family, you kind of have to look at it in some ways as an extension of PR. Yes. Because in many cases, that's what it is. And I think that's a disservice to people. And again, oh, did I find out how people feel about how much people should know? I I did like Mm -hmm. a silly little video. It's always the videos. It's always the ones you do are going to be silly. Yep. And then they get over a million views. And you're like, this was not where I was going. I did a video on the Guardian's cost of the crown and talking about Mm -hmm. financial transparency. And people got so mad at me. Mm -hmm. Do you you think you should know what everyone you know what everyone makes and blah blah like, blah well there's write taxes the article, yeah people all. i was like i did not write the article people were like american and i'm like uh you should talk to your own folks yes. over the yeah. pond because they wrote the article <laughs> you know it's just like don't be mad at me but it's so interesting to me because i feel like fin- financial transparency mm-hmm. is probably one <laughs> of the most important things to understand about the royal family Definitely. i think understanding how they amass wealth and mm-hmm. how they are being funded by the government and how it's changed well, I, th- and I would argue that's important. And how they've lobbied to keep the system in place that allows them to continue coming out on top, whether that's through like environmental regulations that they can now be exempt from or in keeping, you know, the the sovereign grant, the way that it, like all that stuff. It's they're not apolitical. They are interested in politics if it keeps them going. But isn't it funny how successful um, or interesting how Queen Elizabeth was really able to successfully paint herself, especially in her later years? I kind of call it the grandma effect, the mima effect, because it just feels like people didn't want to go hard at her because she's like old and cute and you just want to put her in your pocket and like bring her around. But I I think at some point, I hope people are going to start taking a more critical look at her reign. And maybe because I I sit here and I think about it, really, the media rapidly changed during Queen Elizabeth's reign. And of course, Mm -hmm. part of that is just the digital world. But like, would a different leader have created and been more forceful with a different kind of relationship? You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? It's like we never really look at if if Queen Elizabeth was such a great ruler. And I'm not saying that she wasn't. I don't know enough about her reign. Why are things so crappy you know what I mean there's a lot of issues yeah definitely I think oh my gosh you can talk about everything in that from Prince Philip controlling a lot of the royal family's relationship with the media I would love to do a deep dive on that someday oh my gosh please or the the creation of the royal rota which I think if you're looking for a way to reform the palace's relationship with the press abolish the royal rota that is a system that has been created to do nothing for for the free press but to do everything for like you said having the press be an extension of palace pr because they take what's handed to them press releases photo ops it's almost a way of like keeping them busy keeping them satisfied with it's like when you have a toddler you're like hey play with these blocks while i go um you know get around environmental regulations right (laughs) and that's why i think maybe that's more extreme than most people for your toddler i don't know i don't have kids um but that's why i think the guardian pieces were so abrasive to people because it was right before the coordination coronation it was not written by royal road reporters that that are used to fluffing you know the monarchy um it kind of came out of left field for some people who were reading and seeing photo ops from very friendly journalists in the lead up to the coronation and then all of a sudden guardian has decided to do this like expose series and it it was saucy timing. I enjoyed it, but it, it was, was beautiful. Yeah. They burned it down. They said, <laughs> oh, you want to talk about slavery? But then it prompted, I still cannot get over the Kate Middleton's ancestor. Oh, Harriet. Basically, yeah. Megan should be at, like Grateful. kissing Kate's feet yeah. because her ancestor was kind of an abolitionist and Meghan Markle's ancestor was a slave, an enslaved the, person. And My yeah. God. The, the tweets that came out that week chef's kiss and you know again some of them were a little abrasive they weren't stuff i was going to feature but behind the scenes i will tell you i was giggling my i ass did enjoy off. listen yes. i'm not gonna say i didn't laugh at carrie at tubman oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it was funny like yeah sometimes you have to laugh the, um, the level yeah. of absurdity that we've taken this to like 
what are we doing? It's like, who spent time? Someone was really proud of themselves, too. They're like, I found the I've connection. I connected the dots, yeah. Kate can't be a racist because she had one family member with abolitionist, like, feelings. But I think apparently that, that um, I don't remember it, but she was, like, a, a thought leader in a different field. Yes. Like, actually a fascinating person, but not necessarily, like, ending slavery and forcing well, she, the hand of... she was about a generation earlier, I think, if I'm remembering yeah, correctly, I, she lobbied what, Andrew Jackson, not Abraham fam- Lincoln. Famously, Fam- loves marginalized people. Yeah, right. Andrew Jackson, not if you're listening to this and you don't know history, that is not true. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, <laughs> uh, it was just it was so wild, and it again spoke to the length that parts of the press will go to to make the royal family look good, which any other institution being covered by the press, you would not find that happening. So my X, when when I started making content, my partner at the time, he is a journalist. He's covering the state government here. I and love that. I know. He, he's really good at it. And he has sources on both sides of the aisle. And he's universally loved and hated on both sides of the aisle. They respect that he's a good journalist. And he will get you on something if there is something to find. But also he maintains these, you know, civil friendly relationships with sources and even with people who he's quote unquote uh, exposed he there's that level of understanding that you're doing a job you are you are um contributing to the free press you are you have a responsibility to report objectively that does not exist with the royal rota and the royal nope. family that is the i would say one of the only places where that type of reporting is not just labeled straight propaganda and, and understood as such it's actually stunning and once mm-hmm. you see it and dig into it you cannot unsee it yeah you just cannot see it okay last question before we wrap up okay what is the hill that you'll die on as it relates to the british royal family like what is your take (sighs) that you will take to the grave let me think about that really quick because i do not want to just say it was it was no there was no cape on kate's dress i don't want to go with that (laughs) oh my god (laughs) the way i didn't know about the cape like Funny, for someone who worked in a fashion blog, I'm not a fashion girly. Like, I, I am, but I miss stuff like that. I was like, are we fighting over capes? Yes, we were. Cape or no uh-huh. cape? I don't think it was a cape either. Alex no. convinced me. So People send I me was pictures like, of a seam. I'm like, yeah, that's her waist. That's not a cape. Like, this, ugh, anyway. Uh, I don't want that to be the hill I will die on, though. Oh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> that's a recent hill. That's more, more of like a mole hill. It's like a little hill. This is like the mountain. Yeah, let me think of my mountain really quick. Um, yeah, nope, no problem. We can tie together a couple pieces of royal history here, but the hill I will die on is Queen Elizabeth and, to an extent, her ancestor, Queen Victoria, are not feminist icons and should never be read as such. Yes. <laughs> Stunned silence. Yeah. No, uh, that's, a, that's a really good point. Yeah. The So... Queen Victoria is one who I think it happens with a little bit less because we have some written documentation from her in saying things, essentially saying, I'm just a woman. I should never have been given the crown and I do it because it's my duty. Uh, And in some ways it's a burden. She left a lot of the governing to Prince Albert, a lot of the decision making, because again, she was just a woman (laughs) in her view. And uh, in that very Victorian view of like family life, The man should be the head of the household. So she really viewed being queen as something that she had to overcome in a way. And I don't think it's that extreme with Queen Elizabeth. But one of the things right after her death that really irked me was calling her an icon and a beacon for like women's history. And it's the same kind of thing where I'm not going to say, you know, she never would have wanted to be in power. I don't know that much about her beliefs of feminism. But I think she did view being queen as a duty, first and foremost. And I know her parents viewed being the monarch as something that was kind of foisted upon them because her uncle, Edward VIII, like, shirked his own duty. So there's all these... Under a year. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's all these people who, you know, in Elizabeth's proximity, who had all these views about the crown as a job and something you're called to do. It's your higher calling and you need to put your personal feelings aside. So I don't think Queen Elizabeth was girl bossing her way into, you know, being the UK's longest ever reigning monarch. Girl bossing? I'm just like imagining her in like a, in a pink pussy hat. 
You know what I mean? Oh, I mean, God. obviously that's different, yeah. but can you imagine? <laughs> Just like burn and bras. No, I agree with you. I think, and this is something that like having um, a, a woman or a marginalized person in a place of power does not mm-hmm. necessarily mean that they aren't adhering to the patriarchal white structure that they are meant to uphold. Hello, Margaret in- Thatcher. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Right. It's like, yeah, women be bad too. And I think from, from all that I, w- that I was able to read, uh, and that I've read into, I, I'm not super well versed in her beliefs, but Queen Elizabeth was pretty traditional and yeah. and and fairly seemingly conservative in some ways. And I don't think she was being. It's so interesting the way we take her being a queen, or some mm-hmm. people do, as like here is like a feminist icon, like you said, mm-hmm. because she's at the top. But she she's only at the top because of bloodline. It's not mm-hmm. like she fought for this job because she wanted to make a certain amount of change it was like well this is my duty and she's very duty bound to the country and very traditional so yeah yeah, I agree with you I think I think we just always it feels like we always want people or events to mean something bigger definitely you know what I mean like we really need it to mean more Mm -hmm. yeah we want to have the punchy you know Instagram caption and the tagline and you can make a shirt that says girl boss like fine whatever um but that's so far from the reality and we have to remember when we're watching the royal family we are watching world history like writing itself and that's the thing with the press that i find the most frustrating is that this at the end of the day is an attempt to rewrite the historical record to reflect whatever an interested party wants it to reflect so that's the tough part Thanks again to Amanda for joining us today. If you'd like to follow her, you can find her creating royal content on Instagram and TikTok at Mata underscore of underscore fact. To find her podcast, just look for The Art of History wherever you get your podcasts, and we will include a link to all of these places in the show notes. And that was the interview with Miss Mata of Fact. Thank you so much for joining us, Amanda. Alex, what'd you think of the interview that you haven't listened to yet? <laughs> <laughs> well for one i know it's amazing because it was my girls um two i can't wait to listen and leave a five-star review because i know it's gonna be amazing. oh i love that plug for <laughs> reviews look at you you little saleswoman okay and my new mic with that's gonna be you guys amazing audio you like how i'm doing my voice like that? she now? doesn't have big dick energy she has big mic energy right here okay like you guys have no idea i'm feeling myself yes. i got the blue mic it's, she's you know, playing with her so hair cool. she's feeling it i'm feeling very Wendy williams right now i'm like ooh, purr how you doing <laughs> <laughs> how you doing guys <laughs> All right. Never boring. Okay, I need to stop. Never boring around here. <laughs> well, that is all for this episode of Lady Audacity. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss more of our coverage. Alex, where can the good people find us? You guys can find us on Spotify. You can find us on podcast. Pod- you can find us on podcast. <laughs> You can find us on podcasts, no biggie, guys. But Spotify, Apple, all of those platforms, and of course, our social medias, Instagram and TikTok, which is Lady Audacity, and that T is T-E-A at the end. Yes, thank you. And um, remember, if you have any complaints, we would sure love them first <laughs> yeah. in email form. Um, our email is Lady Audacity. Again, that's T-E-A at gmail.com. And until next time, pinkies up. Cheerio. Two two cookies. Cheerio. Conspiracy cookies.